Welcome to the Imaginaries. We are the Imaginaries podcast, and as you can tell, our audio has changed this week. Improved. Improved audio, although both of us have, of course, caught head colds <laughs> as a result of improving our audio <laughs> and the resulting <laughs> problems. Um, will no doubt cause this to be as painful to listen to as all of our previous podcasts combined. No, it'll be fine. Apologies. It'll be great. Welcome to the podcast. Today we are actually going to discuss a new release. Um, So we are going to talk about Ian McDonald's Luna New Moon, a Mm -hmm. science fiction novel released in 2015, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, to some acclaim, Mm -hmm. um, and has been described as Game of Thrones... Crossed with Dallas of the 70s and 80s television prominence um, in space. So it has a lot to live up to, including the reason why I picked it up in the first place, an endorsement by Kim Stanley Robinson, known for the Red, Blue, and Green Mars trilogy uh, from the 80s, correct? Uh, I want to say it was... 90s, 90s, early 90s, possibly too? 90s. It probably took a long time to write that yeah. many pages. Yeah. So possibly, yeah. there you go. So Ian McDonald is an author I am new to. However, he has been well known to other people for quite a while, yeah. writing Decades. since the early 80s, mm-hmm. and fairly fairly well acclaimed for a novel which I have not read called Brazil. So if you're interested in Ian McDonald, there is a large body of work out there. Um, but I'm going to throw this question straight to Tony, who read the book after me in the last couple of days. Mm-hmm. What happens in this book? All right, so I have to preface this with the caveat that we both were just sick. So I read all of this book basically in 24 hours while I was too loopy to like get out of bed. I wasn't actually that bad. I, I wandered around and drank Dayquil and stuff. In a but, daze. Yes, yes, in a daze. With that said, I mean, it really is kind of Dallas in space. Like, it's the story of these family dynasties on the moon. Each of the dynasties is based on a different sort of thing. We follow one family that's based in helium mining. There's another family that's based in heavy metal mining. There's another family that's based in transport on the moon. There's another family that's based in some exports, something, something, something. Mm -hmm. Each of these families is called a dragon. So the family that the book primarily follows is the family that was the latest, Mm -hmm. the last of the dragons to come to prominence, the Mm -hmm. fifth dragon. Mm -hmm. Um, And the matriarch of this family is... Adriana Corta, whose uh, life the book, I don't want to say follows exactly, but we switch between, this book is structured in a pretty straightforward third person, from a third person perspective. Um, We only switch into first person when we're getting the background of her life. So her 80 years, both on Earth and on the moon, first 30 years on Earth, last 50 on the moon. But then we hop around and see a lot of different characters. I want to say there are a lot of comparisons to Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that comes from not just the focus on dynastic families struggling for power, but also the fact that there are so goddamn many characters. (laughs) And I mean that in a good way. Like, it's interesting, but this is not a character-driven book. And by that I mean it is driven by characters in the plural. Like, we don't follow really one character's development not the plot or not the setting. This is a book that is very, very focused on building its world via all these different colorful characters. And we're relatively restricted to that one family and the people who serve the one family. This is not a quiet little character piece. This is a book that has the grandiose forefronted like crazy. I guess forefronted is kind of like crazy at the same time, but yeah. <laughs> okay, but explain that. Like explain your application of the word grandiose. Is this a book where there are extensive descriptive passages set on the moon's surface that are gonna impress you with that? Or what what do you mean by grandiose? Alright, that's a good question. So I guess I could mean grandiose in a couple of different ways. This is definitely not a book where you're going to sit down and sit quietly with a passage that could go on for pages that's describing, you know, a crater that a character is looking out at and thinking about what that crater looks like and what the character is feeling. And I'm sort of, I'm describing this in a really uninteresting way. (laughs) And 
I think that could be really interesting, and I've seen things like that done very, very well, but you're not going to see that in this book. When I say grandiose, I guess I mean more, and I, I don't want to use this term, but operatic. Mm -hmm. This book is very operatic in that it cycles you through a lot of characters. They're feeling a lot of big things. This is a big book. The emotions are definitely thrown out there. The characters are struggling and fighting, and it's, I mean, it's operatic in that it's soap operatic. I would definitely agree, and I think that's where the comparisons to Dallas come in, in that you have a, a large family dynasty working in some sort of blue-collar industry, mm -hmm. but are themselves fairly aristocratic mm -hmm. and dealing with the fine points of, like, relationships with each other, mm -hmm. which is... That's the primary driver of this book. I have to admit, when I picked it up off of the shelf, my expectation looking at the cover and from the comparison in my mind to Kim Stanley Robinson was that mm -hmm. this is going to be a book in which there's a lot of hard science. Mm -hmm. The cover is definitely one of those beautiful minimalist science fiction covers that forefronts uh, an alien technology, mm -hmm. which in my mind, there's a general trend towards mm -hmm. hard science when mm -hmm. you see a cover like that. Of course, this is the soft cover. The hard cover of this book came out in 2015, so I don't know what that design looked like if it was similar. And the sequel to New Moon has just recently come out, and I have also not seen that not one. Not yet, not yet. It's not until March 2017. Oh, not until That's March. Okay, we thought it was September, but we were lying. I think, they, I think they pushed it off. But it was September of this year at some point, and now it's next year. So sometime in the near future, you will be able to pick up the sequel to this book. I do recommend, of course, reading them in order, yeah. um, mm -hmm. because nothing in a second book will make sense if you have not read this first one. It is one of those books that has a clear plot, mm -hmm. a linear plot arc going on, mm -hmm. unlike certain portions, at least, of Game of Thrones, where mm -hmm. you have circular arcs mm -hmm. and you have jumps back and forth in time. This book starts at the beginning of uh, a particularly eventful time in the court of family, and it proceeds at pace with very clearly delineated uh, flashbacks and leaps in time through forward, for the most part, through the events as they unfold, and then concluding once all of the flashbacks have themselves been unveiled in sequence. Mm -hmm. Like, it's interesting, because you flash back to a certain point in time, and then all of the flashbacks proceed in a linear fashion mm -hmm. as well. Yes. So it's a very straightforward book in yes. that sense. Yeah, temporally straightforward. Now, what did you think of the characters? I might be critical of this book, but I want to say that I really did enjoy it. By that, I just mean it was really nice to sit down and read this book um, all the way through, because it's, it's a book that kind of demands your attention. I was having a hard time getting into it over the past week before I got sick, sitting down and reading like 10 or 15 pages at a time because I couldn't really keep up with any characters, I couldn't keep up with the story because it was switching between so many characters. But once I sat down and really had the time to invest in it, which being sick is very good for, <laughs> um, I got into it in that way um, and was able to appreciate the whole canvas on which this book is spread when really I was only looking at one little section and not seeing how it compared to others. To your question, <laughs> the characters... I said already that this is not a character-driven book, and that is true. Um, it is a book that is driven by characters, which is not the same thing as a character-driven book. Because we're not focusing on one character, we're, we're not focusing, focusing on, on an aggregate. Right, exactly. So these characters are there to illustrate the world, and we don't necessarily see them change from beginning to end, with the exception of Adriana, whose entire life we do see, So, but we see it through her eyes. So she's curating, narrating her own life for the reader, for the person who is hearing the story. We get the, the clearest character arc with her simply because we see her, her entire life and there mm -hmm. better be some sort of arc there. Mm -hmm. With the other characters, and th this is a tricky thing because it feels like saying we don't get a whole lot of arc with the rest of the characters means that they're flat or two-dimensional or uninteresting, and I don't want to imply that. We don't flesh them out singularly, but together they form a really rich painting of a, a world, a moon in the future, and we don't need really detailed character arcs for every character. What we have is enough to populate the world that Ian MacDonald creates. It's a book that's not focused on getting two or three characters through these, you know, multiple arcs over the course of the book. It's a book that's focused on using two dozen characters, all of whom are interesting in comparison with one another, around one another, inhabiting this world that McDonald's created, 
Um, and we don't need a whole lot more than that. So, so in that sense, the comparisons to Kim Stanley Robinson are accurate. Absolutely, yeah. In, in that way, especially with the Mars trilogy. Like, less so with something like 2312, but with the Mars trilogy where we're so focused on all of these characters. Although there are a few that those books choose to focus on specifically, but yeah, more similar to that. Yeah, and I wanted to I wanted to hit on some of the characters specifically. Very handily, Ian McDonald, um, or his editor, mm-hmm, has mm-hmm. provided a character list at the beginning of mm-hmm. the book. And in this case, it really was helpful for me to scan that. I scanned it once at the beginning, and then a couple times as I was reading to make sure that I was remembering people in relationship to each other correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing that was completely useless to me was the map of the moon that they provided. Um, <laughs> it was never once important to, to no. know where these things are happening in relationship no. to each other. Right. And part of that is the submarine nature of how mm-hmm. these people are living on the moon. They're living, mm-hmm. for the most part, under the surface, or in the case of one family, on a train mm-hmm. that travels on tracks that um, <laughs> circumnavigate to the lunar surface. Mm-hmm. Um, keeping the sun at its... Um, directly overhead. Directly zenith. overhead. Zenith. It's zenith. I was thinking yeah. perihelion. I'm like, no, that's yeah. wrong. <laughs> okay, so the first character, of course, you've mentioned of importance is Adriana Corta, Corta, who is the founder of Corta Helio, and Helio is the business, the dragon itself. Mm-hmm. And she has... Is it five children? Five children. She has five children. Well, it, Four, definitely. One that's a little, eh, you know. Well, it's, it's definitely, it's a part of the family. And, yeah. it, and he, that we can explain that in a second. Mm-hmm. Her um, Oko, or spousal partner, is actually deceased. But because this is set in the future with genetic engineering and surrogate mothers, um, they get around the problem of having a deceased spouse and wanting to use their genetic material by essentially freezing eggs and then um, <laughs> uniting them in a lab and then implanting them in a surrogate. And that's how the Corda family has historically reproduced. Mm-hmm. Carlos, her Oko, is dead. He's not an important character in this book, except for how he influenced Adriana when she was at um, a formative stage of her life. Mm-hmm. Um, Rafael Corda is her oldest son. He is the golden child. Mm-hmm. He is the epitome of privilege. <laughs> He is the one who pisses me off the most. <laughs> he has major issues as a father. Mm-hmm. The daughter that he is concerned about is Luna and then Robson, his son, yes. by a wife who he does not see very often. Um, and then we have Lucas Corta, who mm-hmm. is the second son. He is the dark son. So mm-hmm. we have a yin-yang thing going on. Mm-hmm. While Raphael is like expansive in his emotions and gestures. Lucas is very controlled. He's the one who wants to run the company and knows that he's mentally in a place where he can run it effectively. Mm-hmm. And um, so this creates some conflict between oldest and second son. I was worried for a while it was going to follow the typical oldest second son stereotype in novels. I think it, for the most part, pleasantly avoided that. But that's another matter. And then after Lucas, we have Ariel Corda who is the daughter, and she is a problematic character to me for a couple of reasons, but she's also excellent for several other reasons. She is a lawyer, so she is the child who has decided to absent herself from family affairs and instead take on an active role in lunar politics. And so she's being recruited by various um, groups interested in altering the future of uh, lunar politics, and it's very interesting to watch her kind of navigate that. The fourth child of Adriana is Carminhos Corta, and he is the, like, blue-collar worker kid. So Mm -hmm. he's the one who gets out and messes around in the dirt. He's the one who runs out on the actual lunar surface under the exposure of solar radiation, who just, like, does the work and enjoys the physicality of it. He's the physical son. Um, And then last but not least, we have I always said Wagner in my head. I did, too. (laughs) It's probably (laughs) Wagner, but... We call him Wagner. Wagner. Wagner, because he's very much like Wagner, the the composer. He's very like oh planetary. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking Kurt Wagner, like Nightcrawler. <laughs> oh, ooh, that's a good one too. So Wagner is the child who has been partially disowned, but partially also swept under the rug and included in a lot of things. He is. Um, Spoiler alert, not related to everyone in the Corda family, and this is the cause of some tension, Mm -hmm. but because it is an important plot point, we're not going to unveil the details of that. What is interesting about Wagner Wagner. is that he is the lunar equivalent of Oko. 
werewolf. Like of all of the things that happen in this book, what happens with Wagner is the most fantastical. Mm -hmm. And I say that in the literary sense. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. the most offbeat with the quote-unquote hard science elements that are mm -hmm. occasionally included in this mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. So he is a werewolf who is changed in substance when the earth is in full view mm -hmm. above the moon's surface. So a rather interesting sort of scenario to set up. And this mm -hmm. is like a whole culture or underground culture happening mm -hmm. in the lunar, um, actually all of the lunar colonies. There's like a, a pack in every big city under the lunar surface. So he is tapping into some of that. I'm hoping we see a lot more of that in future books because I don't think it's sufficiently developed in this book personally. I don't know how you feel about that. The name of the sequel is Luna Wolf Moon, so I'm mm -hmm. sort of assuming that we will get more of that. Well, one hopes. Um, there are two big things that I want to talk about in this book now that we're about 18 minutes into it. First thing is, you already used the word oko, mm -hmm. um, meaning a partner or a spouse. Um, and I want to talk about how this book uses language, specifically how it uses loan words mm -hmm. to sort of encapsulate concepts or provide concepts that aren't in English. And what's interesting, well, I won't get into what's interesting about that, but uh, we'll, 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 get, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. And the reason why I didn't want you to talk about... Um, Lucas Hino. Thank you. Um, is that he is very much, not solely, but primarily... The avatar of sexuality of this mm. book. Because, Him and Ariel. Yes, most definitely. Um, and <coughs> talking about sexuality in this book and how very central it is, mm. specifically non-heterosexual sexuality, mm -hmm. is something that I really want to talk about. Because for all this book does with non-dominant sexuality in cool ways... I do have some problems with it. Specifically, well, we'll get to that in a second, too. So do we want to go with language first, or do we want to go with sexuality? Okay, let's talk about sex first. Okay, so my caveat there is that all of the praise I want to rightfully give this book, it addresses non-dominant sexuality. It shows many of the characters on a spectrum of sexuality. So you'll have, you see pretty much all of the characters who display any sexuality whatsoever, none of them are exclusively heterosexual, and none of them are exclusively homosexual. They're attracted to both men and women. You have characters who, who use different pronouns who identify as neither man mm -hmm. nor woman. Um, and some of those are related to the wolf form, yes, I should know. Yes, yes. Um, and you see some sexuality. There are not a whole lot, um, but not problematically. But what my problem is, most directly, is that this book is all about glorious sex that does not recognize gender, that does not think about sex, uh -huh. but which is all about beautiful people having it with oh, each yes. other. Yes, yes. Everyone who has sex oh. in this book, it just it is lavishly described in terms of their their abs and their pecs and mm -hmm. their asses mm -hmm. and their dicks and their I I and I mean oh, oh, it's, it's but I have an addition to make. Yes, yes. Because Go it's on. not just the sex where this yes, happens. Yes. It's the Oh, uh, yes. yes. So there is something about the, um, I would say, like, rites of passage to mm -hmm. privilege, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unfettered sex, yes. um, access to designer clothing at yes. will, yes. all of these things, which is definitely being highlighted in this book. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think a lot of it was intentional, but oh, yeah. some of it, yeah. some of it seems to be um, escapist in the sense that McDonald has decided the only way to display a positive sexual relationship that transmogrifies. <laughs> he leapfrogs the current political situation mm -hmm. and the, per the current wonderful conversations happening in our culture, mm -hmm. especially in America, but also abroad, about the role of gender yes. and its interaction with mm -hmm. sexual orientation, mm -hmm. um, its interaction with romantic mm -hmm. um, attractions and romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. Like, all of these things as different axes of attraction and mm -hmm. identity, I think, is a really rich area. Yes. And I think it's a mistake to leapfrog it and to say, well, we can't 
neaten this up. So we're just going to go for sex after this has all been resolved. Yeah. And we're not going to talk about it. Right. And what, what bothers me about that is that we get, and again, we get like Adriana's view of the past, the past 80 years, um, settling mm-hmm. the moon, how she came to work there in the first place. But from what we see of the other major families and the other, you know, million people who are living on the moon, almost two million, I think, isn't it? Yes. Um, it's not a whole lot, like, it's not a, a utopian colony in the same way that you would find in, like, the Dispossessed or something. Mm. Like, this is a group of, like, very business-minded, capitalistic, conservative, you know, people, they just happen to be on the moon. And so, granted, we're seeing it, you know, mostly from the Corda's point of view, but it just seems sort of... It seems artificial that we would have does. solved yeah. the sex thing, yeah. but nothing else. Right, right. Like, they're... <laughs> There's still all sorts of discrimination, oh, yes. and, uh, and that it happened to be this one thing, and it's open to the point that, like, group sex is okay, pansexuality is okay, mm-hmm. like, everything is accepted in all forms. I, I don't know. It just, it's a little however, disingenuous. However. Yeah. Like, I think that the book's silences say a lot about Mm -hmm. McDonald's own awareness of the larger conversations we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And a great example is his very brief dealing with the subject of rape. In that it's Mm -hmm. mentioned, I think, Mm -hmm. once, Mm -hmm. perhaps Mm -hmm. in the context of the legal system on the moon is bare bones. And he has stated multiple times throughout the book from various characters' mouths that on the moon... You don't have law. You mm-hmm. have negotiation. Mm-hmm. Everything is negotiable, yep. including how these families deal with rape. Yes. But you can imagine in a society where power mm-hmm. is the determining factor behind negotiation, the powerless are going to receive the raw end of the deal when yes. it comes to essentially their equivalent of legislation. Yes. And so I find it deeply problematic yep. that in a culture that is still dominated by and large by men, Yes. You're going to just say, we're not going to legislate against rape. Yeah. That's not a big deal. Right. No worries. It gets one half of a sentence yep. in this entire massive tome. So, yeah. yes, I agree that I yes. don't want to diss the book as a whole, but there are certain things where it lags on. And I think that the yes. dealing with sexuality is one of them, even though he just won an award for it, for cool. specifically its... Um, sexual components, mm-hmm. it's progressiveness. Yes. Um, and I just, I agree with you, like, the, the creating a sexual utopia that is not a utopia in any other way feels grating if you're not acknowledging that mm-hmm. and you're not describing the mechanics that put this utopia in place. Yes. I, I actually didn't know about the award, and I don't want to uh, undercut this book for what it does because what it's doing well is making non-dominant sexuality really visible. And I really like that. Like, he made a conscious choice, Ian McDonald did, to make the the eagle of the moon, the president or the head or however you want to say it, I, I forget exactly what the... Um, what the system of um, yeah the eagle is. the eagle is essentially he's an earth appointed representative mm-hmm. um, who has a moral if not legal authority on the planet yes and we see and he, and he's gay and I mean you know it might be more complicated than that but we only ever see him with one committed male partner which you know could be problematic in and different this, ways and this but... partner has significant control over him yes right. Right. So it's more a marriage of convenience than anything it feels like. But I will also note um, that, you know, what we see of sex and sexuality in this book is very limited to the court of family. So, you know, the really, really privileged on the moon and sort of their luxurious dalliances. And the only character who we follow for an extended period of time who is not a member of the court of family or associated with them but serves them. Uh, we get no sexuality for her whatsoever. Actually, that's not entirely true, because remember, well, she I guess it's romantic. She falls in true. love with, okay. the, with right. Carlene Host. You're right. So she falls in love with a member of the Corda family, it yes. is, and she has a sexual dalliance with him. Yes. But it's unclear that's true. Whether, that would, about that. whether that would qualify as her sexuality, like her complete sexuality. Yeah. I do believe that she mentions once or twice that she's kind of a little shocked Mm -hmm. and out of place at how free everyone is. Mm -hmm. And so she is in the process of discovering these things, or should be. It's just not described in great detail. The award I was mentioning is the Galactic Spectrum Award. So it's like a play on Galactic, of course. Nerdy space um, sex, I guess. (laughs) 
nerdy space sex. Which is great. Yeah. Like, I think the fact that he's willing to go full at sexuality yes. is an admirable thing. Oh, yeah. I'm just not sure about the final execution. Yeah, yeah. That, 100%. Like, the fact that this book tackles sexuality and tackles so many different sexualities is mm-hmm. wonderful. And I really, really mm-hmm. don't want that to get lost in our critique of it. Because... It's really important to see this from a writer of this caliber who's mm-hmm. been writing in mm-hmm. science fiction for decades and mm-hmm. winning awards mm-hmm. and is someone who's really respected. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the fact that this is out there cannot underscore the importance enough. Just this is, you know, I, I don't want to say a first step because that seems like it's devaluing what people have done before. Mm-hmm. But this is mm-hmm. this is something that is positively out there in the world mm-hmm. and I appreciate it for its presence. And I think we'll talk... Um, a little bit further on about how we feel about it as the first installment of a clearly planned out uh, Mm -hmm. series. Mm -hmm. So it isn't the full picture, and that both provides possibilities and some frustrations for Mm me. Um, The last point I personally wanted to make about the portrayal of sexuality in this book, um, I have talked about briefly with Tony outside of the podcast before, but I wanted to, I wanted to just say as an asexual person myself, that is my identification, who is also an aromantic and a gender person, reading this book and seeing, <laughs> seeing McDonald fairly clearly take the A in LGBTQIA plus <laughs> and adapt it for a new category of individuals was... It was disjointing for me. Um, so the background of this is that the character Ariel, she is an autosexual, which means that she gets her knickers off herself, essentially. Like, she she gives herself all the pleasure she needs. She doesn't need other people. I, I think that autosexual, in my limited understanding, probably encompasses some elements of being aromantic as well as um, several other things, like asexual. She's not attracted to other people. So I think it's it could be welcome under the A umbrella, but the, the asexual community specifically and the aromantic and the agender communities have historically struggled with erasure. Like a lot of other queer communities, we've really struggled with seeing the A taken out of LGBTQIA+, and sold to the public as standing for allies. Mm -hmm. So we are used to this letter being taken from us and given to other people. We would more than welcome allies and autosexuals to identify partially with the queer community, if not fully with the queer community. Yay. The more the merrier. Awesome. We love it. Come. But um, I think in the context of this book, it's reductive. So the only A that we're given is autosexual. And this is problematic partially also because, uh, I don't know whether it was the same chapter or earlier, there were actual mentions of, like, the bi and various other letters kind of being spelled out. So it's clear that McDonald was essentially operating from a template, the LGBTQTIA letters, and then exploding them out in this book. And he provided complexities for all of the other letters that he explored. They were lived in. I loved his exploration of pansexuality, of bisexuality, of other sort of categories. I just felt like, like any other times in life, that the A doesn't get much love. And so I love Ariel's character. I'm not a huge fan of how he describes her pleasuring herself because it sounds like he took a woman's body to a butcher shop and then, like, diagrammed it. But apart from that, there's a lot of generosity in how he deals with sexual encounters. There's a lot of semen, literally, (laughs) Uh um, in a lot of different contexts, and it's usually very sumptuously described scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I think Lucasino's character specifically provides us with an avenue into exploring a lot of different sexualities in a really wonderful way. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to diss him entirely. I just want my asexuals to have, like, a moment in the sun. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Segway! Segway. Language. Language. So I'm turned to the glossary. This book has a glossary. Mm -hmm. 
um, because it, it uses many terms that are unfamiliar. And it the glossary starts off by saying many languages are spoken on the moon, and the vocabulary cheerfully borrows words from Chinese, Portuguese, Russian, Yoruba, Spanish, Arabic. It goes through Korean. <clears throat> what else is in here? Brazilian, Argentinian. I would say predominantly the culture he's interested in is Brazilian. Linguistically, yes. we mostly get Korean and Japanese, I believe. Yes, yes. But... I will say straight off that as far as what I think what this is trying to evoke is that the lunar community is really multicultural, really multilingual. Like we're, you know, we're coming and we as people who are coming to the moon are coming with all these different traditions, cultures, languages, um, societal expectations, and we're we're running them all together and we're forming our own communities, but we're also part of this lunar community. And so culture that evolves on the moon, therefore incorporates these different terms. Mm -hmm. And I'm not buying it. That's what I'm going to preface okay, this Okay, but let's, let's break it down a little bit more. Because I think to, to understand the role of language, we have to understand what he was trying to go for. Mm -hmm. And I should have stated when I was talking about the individual characters and the mm -hmm. families, the different five dragons. Each of the dragons is sourced in a particular specific culture on earth mm -hmm. so we have one family that is western australian mm -hmm. thank <laughs> you so much wanted yeah. to see that in science fiction forever <laughs> they are the mackenzie family and mm -hmm. they are the primary antagonist to the corda family and the corda family is very very holistically wholeheartedly brazilian Brazil. in that they won't even allow one of their surrogates to um provide a nice, comfy flesh home to their babies <laughs> before birth. They don't even allow one of them to be anything but the purest Brazilian blood. So they actually go through this really interesting, extensive... <laughs> I just want to... Sorry. I just, I just want anyone who's listening to this to respond with hashtags based on what we say, and we need a hashtag that is flesh home. So please make that happen. Please continue. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, like, the interview process is, is interesting in and of itself. I didn't buy his portrayal of Brazilian culture. Mm -hmm. I didn't buy his portrayal of Western Australian culture, mm -hmm. in part because, uh, uh, flashback, I actually <laughs> grew up in Australia, not Western Australia, but I did grow up in Australia, and I don't buy his portrayal of these cultures, much less of their languages. And I think the language is, mm -hmm. in this specific sense, a byproduct of a larger fault. And again, I don't want to like lay too much blame at his door. Mm -hmm. Ian MacDonald is a British writer from Belfast. His exposure to Western Australians and Brazilians may be somewhat limited. Mm -hmm. You know, he may not know what these inhabited cultures feel like. I feel like the closest he got was possibly with the Suns, as the Suns family. Um, they're a family that marries into a lot of the other um, families to basically barter power. Um, and they're a very interesting uh, family dragon as well. So I think you're right on with the language being faulty because it feels cherry picked. Each yes. word that's pulled out cherry -picked is, is exactly not the right word. It's not okay. So like Oko, for example. Mm -hmm. It is like a, a state of being word, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it, it's inflected by its um, context when spoken in like actual. Yes. It, this is Japanese, correct? I I assumed so. Oko, I don't. I, it doesn't. It doesn't actually give the derivation for this word in the glossary. I assumed it was Japanese, but that could be a terrible assumption on my part. Well, and like I also do not have uh, like a very in intense exposure to Japanese. I had some in high school. Some of my friends were from Japan. Mm -hmm. And they spoke uh, at great length about how even the basic pronunciation, the spelling as well of these words, these state of being words, would alter based on context. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't buy a lot of these words existing uninflected. Yes. And like not surrounded by other contextual words. Yes. We do get some hints when they're going into like the Brazilian favelas yes. and other like locations on earth mm -hmm. that are more um, embodied, more mm -hmm. um, believable. Mm -hmm. But when you're on the moon <laughs> and you're using these words, like they haven't evolved to fit globo, which is the global lunar language. Right. So it's like everyone speaks globo, which is English. Mm -hmm. Except when they throw in one or two words from these other 
source languages. Right, yeah. And my problem with this is really, I mean, p taking pieces of what you said, it, it feels cherry-picked. It doesn't feel organic. And I think my, my major problem with this, again, is that this sort of idea, this polyglot tongue, I think polyglot is the word I was looking for, if I'm using that correctly, <laughs> um, that, is, that is globo, this lunar language that is, you know, God knows what it actually is. It's English. It's English. The formation of this new language that's that has all of these words from these different people who are making this community is such an interesting turn towards this, you know, this utopian, like, socialist, really <laughs> egalitarian society that in no way exists in, in McDonald's version of the moon. Like, it is capitalist. It's driven mm -hmm. by these families that just want to make money and fuck each other over and mm -hmm. fuck each other. Um, and, and there's it, a lot of collateral damage. Oh, yeah. Like, this is, you know, when the, when people describe this as, as Game of Thrones or The Godfather, as another one that I've seen, mm. like, that is absolutely accurate in terms of how these people behave. This is absolutely not the kind of culture where you would expect these words that are, you know, just sort of, like, organically derived from different cultures, creating this holistic whole language because there aren't concepts that, you know, this language can describe or that language that we want to use. It just feels, it rings so false to me that it, like, when I was finding words like this, it honestly bothered me because I was like, if you're not going to at least give us a little bit of background, and that was the the part where, where Adriana could have really yeah. done something, like, you know, maybe the moon once upon a time had been this, but no, it was like, it was originally a business venture by the Mackenzie family, mm -hmm. and then they were bringing up people to, like, support their business Which, venture. Which, by the way, why aren't there any, like, random Australian terms in here? Yeah, Like, right. nobody speaks, like, the actual culture from which they come. Right, right. So my, my major problem with this was not that I don't want to see it done, not that I don't want to see this sort of, like, you know, interesting usage of other languages in English language science fiction novels when they express concepts that English does not have words for. Like, that is awesome. Like, great choice on an authorial level. Mm -hmm. However, given the reality of this, the world this book creates... It just feels so disingenuous yeah. with, with mm -hmm. what's actually on the page. I personally would have loved this book more mm -hmm. if it had dispensed with the found words, mm -hmm. the cherry-picked words. Yes. If it had stuck with English and highlighted at certain points in the book that they are speaking in a foreign tongue. Yes. Because that doesn't happen very often. I think the only mention of it that sticks with me is Marina, mm -hmm. the character who is a, a human born on Earth, who travels to the moon in search of, like, basically a paycheck. Yep. Um, she comes under the tutelage of the Corda family, and when she does so, she is required to learn simultaneously both Globo and a very specific kind of Brazilian language, like, d derivation of... Portuguese. Portuguese. I think it's Portuguese. Yeah, because they even spend, like, a couple pages talking about all the different kinds of Portuguese. Yes, yes. And how specific this particular particular derivative <laughs> is to lunar that was sourced from a particular derivative um, on from a particular favela or location mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. Earth. And then there's, like, the larger, you know, Portuguese language as well. So, like, he spends some time tracing the history of Portuguese. It kills me <laughs> that he's so terrible at, like, making you feel like these characters actually are speaking Portuguese. Yeah, I miss that, too. I really, I, I mean, it feels like an afterthought. And I want to say it's something that faded away after the middle half of the novel that was mm. really only present, mm -hmm. like, the first quarter, first third. I would have to go back and look at it again if I was to make that claim. It, it's entirely possible that I just sort of, like, skipped over it as I was reading, sure. if, if it continued to happen. But I only really remember it from the beginning of the book when, like, he would have specific markers around tags that say, you know, so-and-so said in Portuguese, or mm -hmm. so-and-so said you know, while switching to Globo or something mm -hmm. like that. But I, I think it does fall away. Like, it's something that is not really integral to the world that the book is creating. And we'll, we'll be talking about Dark Eden in another podcast, but I think it does bear comparison that what happens in Luna New Moon linguistically is problematic for going to one extreme in cherry picking and trying to make it feel authentic by showing found words from specific languages. Whereas Dark Eden, mm -hmm. love it or hate it, mm -hmm. is peculiar in its use of language because it shows 
what's lost mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. And, um, you know, you never have like a new word crop up in Dark Eden. Mm -hmm. You have words that are fused together to describe new objects that weren't encountered on Earth, mm -hmm. but you don't have like wholly new words. Mm -hmm. You just have language in the English language itself evolving a little bit mm -hmm. and losing mm -hmm. some of its shades, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting. So, Definitely, when you're talking about Luna New Moon, you're not talking about a book that is a grand success in portraying a bunch of different cultures, yes. but it does have a lot going on that is really cool. So I thought it would be really exciting, <laughs> since we have talked about some of the things that were failures in this book, to close out the podcast today by maybe talking about our favorite thing from the book. Mm -hmm. So Tony, you first. All right. So... I know I gave it a hard time. I <laughs> gave it a hard time. Sorry. I do have to point out that in this book, <laughs> there are people who have drawn a giant dong on the lunar surface <laughs> that is visible from Earth. Mm -hmm. So, just gotta throw that out there. Um, but my favorite part is really not in, not uh, centralized. Like, I really like the handling of sexuality. Mm -hmm. It's great mm -hmm. to come to a sci-fi book that feels like it's really focused on building the world, like it's really about this dynastic control of the moon, like, you know, has all these things going for it, yet spends a lot of time thinking about these characters' sexualities and how they enact it and how it's not all about the male gaze and men having sex with women who they shouldn't be having sex with because there's all sorts of uncomfortable power dynamics. <laughs> and, like, the fact that we see so much, so many different kinds of sex... And that it's rendered so explicitly, I don't want to say erotically, I would say that the sex in this book has eros, but is not erotic. And what I mean by that is that there's like, there's literary passion in this sex, but it's not meant to titillate me as a reader. And I think part of the way it gets away with that is most of the time when it's describing sex, it's describing the aftermath of sex, yes. which is not titillating like no. foreplay. Right, right, exactly. It does tend to... Uh, have the fade to black moment while the actual sex is happening, but at the same time, it renders it very explicitly before and after. The mostly only after. The only exception being the sex room scene yes, in which true. Ariel Corda's body is uncomfortably exposed to reader's eyes. Yes, yes. I think that that is the... That that was a scene that probably was added later, or yeah. it was it was framed differently from his other sex scenes. Yeah, it definitely was. I sort of wonder if that wasn't like a little bit of executive meddling. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to speculate beyond that. But anyway, what it was... feels different. Yes, it does. I'll I'll leave it there. Well, I mean, my favorite thing about this book, and you've actually hinted at already, which is like its readability. Yeah, I think that a lot of the times when we are gifted with a really high concept sci-fi book. With hard science elements, we're like, oh, crud, it's 450 pages of mechanical engineering that <laughs> I don't have any background in. Right. Um, and I would say that that was a barrier to entry to Kim Stanley Robinson when I was first reading him, because I picked up the Red Mars book first. And um, I also picked it up like almost concurrently with 2312. Mm -hmm. And there's a fair bit of science mm -hmm. in Kim Stanley Robinson. And I felt like I wasn't prepared. Now, he does a great job of preparing you as you read. It's more like I was afraid ahead of time. Mm -hmm. In Luna New Moon, the moment you open this book, you're like in the middle of a sex scene on the moon. <laughs> and I think what that does, uh, apart from just like great portrait of what these characters' primary interest is, yep. um, I think it also just it shoves you straight into the middle of the action. Yep. And so this book has momentum. We've talked about Game of Thrones. Yes. I think it's actually more readable than Game of Thrones. Almost because definitely. what Game of Thrones does that is a failure for me in terms of plot architecture is that it very formulaically jumps from character to character to character at specific breaks. Yeah. And it feels like, okay, well, we've gotten six pages for this particular character and now it's time to move on to another, lest we short someone their pages in this book. Mm -hmm. And Luna doesn't do that. It lets a scene play out until it's done. It lets you see the consequences of the actions um, in individual senses and in a society-wide sense. Mm -hmm. And I think by the time it builds to the final cataclysm that is the heart of this book's climax, I think that you're ready to see like the devastation. Yeah. You're not seeing a bunch of characters just killed off arbitrarily throughout the book. So that comparison to Game of Thrones is at fault. However, you do feel like everyone's living on the edge of a precipice, and that's set up very early on when Marina moves to the moon, and she does not have the credit 
to purchase the oxygen that she needs. She is literally unable to breathe fully because she doesn't have um, the financial access to oxygen that the privileged do on this planet. Um, and I think that it sets up the stakes very, very well. Um, it keeps the plot moving. Um, characters are given um, opportunities to engage with interesting events, even if they aren't necessarily changed by them. And I cared about the conclusion. Now, it's not a finished book. It's not complete. And that bothers me a little bit about all entries, like entry one in a series. Every book that I've ever read that is book one in a series that has been sold to a publisher as book one in a series has that problem for me. However, I think that for what it is, Lunar New Moon is a solid entry into the science fiction canon. And I am grateful to have seen it on the now in paperback shelf <laughs> in Burns and Noble as I was about to fly out. <laughs> yes. So. All right. I think that's it for our discussion of Lunar New Moon. Um, yes. But if you join us next time, we will be discussing not specifically Lunar New Moon, but a large collection of books that are cinematic in yes. scope. Yes. So we're going to be talking about the interaction between cinematic mm -hmm. styles of writing, mm -hmm. I suppose, yeah. and uh, the science fiction genre. And probably a lot of the books we're going to be talking about are ones that you will so totally. check back in with us. Yep. You can follow us on iTunes and on SoundCloud. So please check us out. We might be exploring more ways to use our website soon, too. Yeah. Sweet. We're creative like that. Yep. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Peace. Have a good night.